Hey, welcome to Vortex Garage, and today we're going to do something just a little bit different. You see, in the late 1970s, the DeLorean Motor Company set out to revolutionize the automotive industry by introducing a vehicle that would bring about new technologies and build processes. But when those first stainless steel skin DeLorean DMC-12s rolled off that assembly line in 1981, well, instead of the revolutionary mid-mounted rotary engine, or that revolutionary ERM body structure, what we got was a mundane V6, a standard steel backbone chassis, and performance that simply wasn't befitting the sports car image. What was intended to be a revolution in the automotive industry turned out to be a mere footnote with only 9,000 DMC-12s produced. After two years, DMC declared bankruptcy and production ceased. In many respects, the DeLorean reminds me of an interesting piece of vintage computing hardware, the stainless steel skin Texas Instruments TI-99-4A, which coincidentally rolled off the assembly line the same year those DeLoreans did, 1981. Now, technically speaking, there was a predecessor, the TI-99-4, which was released in 79, but the 4A is what we're going to focus on a little bit more today. So today, we're going to take a look at a Texas Instruments TI-99-4A, and we're going to take a stroll down computing history as we take a look at some of the hardware in the games that made the TI-99-4A one of the more endearing pieces of vintage hardware, which, kind of like the DeLorean, is a little bit unforgettable. Today, we're going to spend some time really digging into this Texas Instruments TI-99-4A home computer. But before we get too far, it's probably a good idea to just take a moment and talk about some real interesting tidbits of this computer's history. Now, when you look at the TI-99-4A, well, it's real easy to see a sleek and early home computer. But it might be hard to fathom and I'll even imagine that lurking within this little home computer was a heart that could have powered an entire generation of computing. And it might also be hard to believe that even though 2.8 million copies of this computer were shipped, the TI-99-4A was basically a flop that resulted in TI exiting the home computer market by 1984. So the story of the TI-99-4 and the 4A thus go prior to their 1979 initial release date, and technically they take root in the TI-990 mini computer from the mid-1970s. Now, during this time, Texas Instruments was a powerhouse in the computing world. They basically made their name developing computer systems and even designing early bipolar-type computing circuits. However, a new technology was emerging in the late 60s to early 70s called Metal Oxide Semiconductors, or MOS. Now, this was the format that would eventually dominate the silicon-based microprocessor chips that we all know. At the same time, a leader in MOS technology was a startup known as Intel. Now, as a leader in computing, TI recognized that they had to compete with Intel, the new kid on the block, and develop their own MOS-based microprocessors. So they set out on this path with the benefit and leverage of a large corporate backing. So one major initiative materialized by taking that TI-990, which was a relatively popular 16-bit mini computer platform for business, and basically shrinking its architecture down to an MOS-based CPU. And this became reality with the release of the TMS-9900 CPU in 1976. However, by leveraging architectures from the TI-990 and, well, being fairly early in terms of a 16-bit CPU, the TMS-9900 ended up with some architectural and packaging issues that hindered it from the start. Now, the scope of this wouldn't be known for the next couple years. You see, in late 1978, representatives from IBM visited the TI Consumer Division offices, basically seeking a proposal for a CPU to power a secret program they were working on. Now, little did TI know, but IBM was also seeking proposals from Motorola and a little startup known as Intel. Now, IBM was a unique and, well, quite demanding customer. 
You see, to pass their muster, after an architectural review, any CPU would basically have to have thousands of samples delivered to them for their review pending any integration into the project. For Texas Instruments, the TMS9900 CPU was the target. However, after providing an overview, IBM sort of became disinterested. Now, as for Motorola, they had the 68000 series of CPU in development, and honestly, it was the clear winner in terms of technological superiority. However, as of 1978, it was still in development and simply wouldn't be ready in time. As a result, Intel became the chosen company for this project, with the Intel 8088 CPU beating out the competition from TI and Motorola. So what was that secret project that IBM was working on anyway? Well, it was none other than the IBM Personal Computer, or IBM PC. And you know, with their selection of the Intel 8088, IBM basically ushered in an entire generation of systems that would leverage the Intel x86 platform as their underpinning architecture. I mean, even today, most PCs, Macs, laptops, well, they leverage a version of that original x86 platform. I mean, who would have thought that that meeting in 1978 for that secret IBM project would basically end up defining a massive part of computing architecture for the next 40 years and beyond? And imagine that missed opportunity at Texas Instruments. Your CPU could have been one the driver revolution. Instead, it powered a home computer that flopped and well, basically resulted in TI leaving the home computer market in 1984. After the TMS 9900 failed to secure the customer base it was expected, TI began to look internally, and as they put it, look for synergies amongst their divisions. In doing so, they found three areas they could combine to target the lucrative and growing home computer market. First, a group in TI was working on a game console type device that would use cartridge-based ROMs. Another group in TI, well, they wanted to build a home computer that would compete with the likes of the Apple II. And finally, a business group envisioned a computer with a 10 megabyte hard disk, and of course they had that TMS 9900 CPU that so desperately needed a home. So these elements were combined, and the result was the release of the TI-99-4 in 1979, which had an initial price of $1,150. Now in 2020, that's equivalent to about $4,000 US dollars. And the TI-99-4, which got to use that 16-bit TMS-9900 CPU, is often seen as the first 16-bit home computer. Now of course, 16-bit computers existed before then, but specifically the, that genre of home computers. However, the TI-99-4 had its issues, and one big one that it had was its keyboard. You see, as those various groups in TI kind of got their synergies in order, well, it resulted in a home computer that was released with a keyboard better fit for a calculator. It used chiclet-style keys and a soft membrane, and it just simply didn't make sense on such a high-priced device. So the TI-99-4A, which was released in 1981, remedied several of these issues, including coming with a much better keyboard. With an initial price of $525, which is equivalent to about $1,500 US dollars in 2020, well, it was also cheaper. But it wasn't cheap enough, and competition was fierce, especially with the release of the popular and much cheaper to build Commodore VIC-20. As time went on, TI would lower the price and offer various incentives and rebates. Within just a year, prices dropped all the way to $99, thanks to a $100 mail-in rebate on a $199 price tag. While these price cuts did help move units, with 2.8 million of these eventually being shipped in total, well, they were basically being sold cheaper than it cost to make them. So while 2.8 million sounds like a success, it wasn't a sustainable one. Eventually, after posting a large quarterly loss in 1984, Texas Instruments pulled the plug on the TI-99-4A. Now before we hook up this TI-99-4A and walk you through a demo of some various games, we're going to take some time to open this one up and get you a chance to see what's inside and how it's built, what makes it tick. It'll also give us a chance to explore the reasons that TMS-9900 CPU was such a letdown and eventually passed on by IBM for use in the IBM PC. And we've got our spare TI-99-4A here, and we're going to go ahead and open it up so we can give you a look inside. 
Now we're not going to do a detailed teardown here. We'll follow up with a separate video for that if you're interested to see how to take yours apart and how to put it back together successfully. What you're going to see when you first open it up though are three main components. The power board, the keyboard, and the main board, which is essentially the motherboard of the computer. So this is the power board. This is where the incoming power from the external power regulator comes in and goes through some additional conditioning and basically getting the correct voltages and power output for the motherboard. With the removal of just three screws, we can go ahead and remove the motherboard from the system as a unit. As you can see, it's encased in a stainless steel shell for protection. Of course, we'll be opening that up later and showing you what the motherboard looks like. Now be very careful when you're removing this because there is a ribbon cable that ties the keyboard to it. Again, we would cover that more if we were doing a full teardown video. Also, as you can see, there's a 90 degree adapter. This is where those cartridges plug in that we're gonna play later. Now a few more screws and we can go ahead and remove the keyboard from the chassis as a unit. Now we're going to keep going and open up that main board and take a look, and we're going to use that as an opportunity to correlate a little more to our story here about the TI-99-4A. Now besides the TI-99-4's strange keyboard, there was one other issue that plagued it and the TI-99-4A still. And that is, while they were known as the first 16-bit home computer, and having a fast for the time 3 MHz clock speed, well, the architectural and packaging issues of that TMS 9900 CPU resulted in a computer that was slower than its potential and more costly to manufacture. As we look at the main board for the TI-99-4A, the first and most obvious thing we see is that large TMS 9900 CPU. Now, it uses a 64-pin DIP, or dual inline package chip format. And this was a very large CPU package for the time. And it was in part due to some of the architectural designs of the CPU with its off CPU registers and early packaging designs. But as other 16-bit CPUs emerged in the marketplace, such as the 8086 and 8088 from Intel, well, a more standardized and cheaper packaging method was available. Another problem that TI had with early 16-bit adoption was the fact that there was limited availability for 16-bit peripheral controllers. Thus, the TI-99-4 series had to utilize 8-bit controllers for memory and other functions. So simply put, this results in bottlenecks that effectively reduce the CPU's potential performance in half, and even as much as one-fourth depending on the type of operation being performed. This means that while the TMS9900 CPU running at a 3 MHz clock speed appears to have been rated at approximately 0.13 MIPS or millions of instructions per second, the real world usage within the TI-99-4A would see it operating at closer to 0.05 MIPS. As a comparison, running at a 4.77 MHz clock speed, the Intel 8088, which was selected for the IBM PC, was able to reach upwards of 0.35 MIPS, with real-world usage in the IBM PC rated at around 0.2 MIPS. This was easily two to four times the processing performance of the TMS9900 CPU. And yes, of course, the development of 16-bit peripheral chips and faster RAM could certainly alleviate some of those bottlenecks. Well, the TMS9900 had some other architectural shortfalls that most likely removed it as a candidate for IBM's PC. Now, one of those was a 16-bit addressable memory space, which basically meant the TMS9900 could only leverage a maximum of 64K of memory. Now, the Intel 8088, on the other hand, well, it retained a 20-bit addressable memory space, which meant it could leverage up to one megabyte of memory. Now, this shortcoming is one that's not easily addressed without re-architecting the design of the CPU and its internal circuitry. Now, while the selection of the CPU for the IBM PC is basically a whole other story and one we hope to address one day, it is kind of neat to point out that the Motorola 68000, which, while a 16-bit CPU, it actually had an internal 32-bit architecture that would have let it grow and scale pretty easily. It also possessed a 24-bit memory space, which bested that of the Intel 8088. You know, one can only imagine if Motorola had had that CPU ready about a year earlier, x86 as we know it would probably be nothing more than a technological footnote. 
Now back to TI. As a result of the shortcomings in the relative shoehorning of that TMS9900 CPU into the TI994 and 4A, well, these home computers basically ended up being more expensive to produce, and they didn't live up to their performance potential. All right, next up, we're going to take a look at the TI-994A in action. Now, while the TI-994A in US spec outputs to an NTSC composite format, a common practice for home users was to connect the device to their existing television sets. Now, early TVs often didn't have incoming composite or RCA connections, but instead they relied on antenna feeds. Now, as a result, the TI-994A uses what's called an RF modulator to connect. Now, the RF modulator is a device that converts the composite output video and audio signal and basically converts it into an over-the-air type radio frequency feed, thus the term RF modulator. Now, the RF modulator connects to the TV antenna input and it switches between antenna feed and composite feed. It also contains a switch allowing the RF to be sent over VHF channel 3 or channel 4. So for our demo, we're going to be using a period correct TV, a 13 inch color general electric unit. Now, as this is an old cathode ray screen, there may be some flutter as we go through these. Also, it's a bit harder to display on camera because when you're using a cathode ray tube, it basically redraws the screen at a rate of approximately 60 Hertz or 60 times per second. Now match that along with the shutter speed of the camera and what you can see often is a rolling shutter type effect on the screen. Essentially, the camera will pick up the times where the screen is being redrawn. But by dialing in the camera settings, we can better match the refresh rate of the CRT. Now one thing you may see sitting by our setup is a beige box, and yep, you guessed it. It's a cassette recorder. But not just any cassette recorder. This device hooks up to the TI-994A and allows programs to be read or written to standard audio cassettes. Of course, I guess at that point they officially become data sets. If you have the misfortune of using cassettes back in the day and having to rewind them to hear a song again, well, you can imagine the difficulty of accessing a program off of one. I mean, you better be sure to have that counter set properly and write down the counter space the program starts on the tape. Of course, if you play a data set and an audio cassette player, what will it sound like? Well, it'll kind of sound like what you would have heard from an early modem. Again, if you had the misfortune of using one of those. Now, once we have our system set up, we can go ahead and power it up. We'll walk through some screens, go through TI Basic and write a little short program, and of course, give you a demo of some awesome games.
But we couldn't leave you hanging. This is what happens when you shoot the UFO. All right, up next is Car Wars, which was released by TI in 1981. And it was actually programmed by Jim Dramas, who actually programmed uh, Munchman and also the classic Parsec. It's a pretty simple game, as you can see. You uh, just basically have to avoid this evil car that tries to crash into you. This was one of the first games in the series of play that I realized our joysticks were going to give us some problems. While you can control the car with the joystick, you can't accelerate with the joystick. Uh, it could be the joysticks themselves. We'll see as we play Parsec later. We're going to have some problems with the fire button. Oh, man. All right, so up next is Jawbreaker and Jawbreaker 2 specifically. And that's kind of confusing since, well, Texas Instruments seem to have sold them under both names. And it's the same game. Same game with the same awesome intro music. Now, Jawbreaker is kind of an interesting one because it was actually originally a Pac-Man clone and one of the earliest games to kind of have legal issues and injunctions called against it. I think they were eventually uh, thrown out, but suffice to say the 8-bit version of Jawbreaker didn't look like a Pac-Man clone and is kind of what we got here, but Jawbreaker's kind of got an interesting backstory to it from an early game perspective. And as we'll do with some of the games today in our short sequences, we'll show you what happens when you win and what happens when you lose. And up next is a real classic, Burger Time. Now, Burger Time's really interesting. The port of it for Texas Instruments' is TI-994A was actually released a few months after TI discontinued the product. So one of the rare games that actually came out after the device was canceled.
And up next is Tombstone City, 21st Century. Now this game was released in 1981, and I guess it's a take on what it's going to look like in Tombstone City in the future. Right. Not sure if we're there yet. As you can see, you gotta kind of run around and shoot these little monsters that come out of the cactuses. Never seen that happen. All right, let's let ourselves get eaten. Up next is Blasto, which was released in the first quarter of 1981 and actually manufactured by Milton Bradley and distributed by TI. This game is actually a port of a 1978 arcade game from Sega Gremlin. And next up is Munchman, which was released in 1982, and another game uh, developed by Dramas, who later wrote Parsec. And interestingly enough, we talked about Jawbreaker being a, a clone of Pac-Man, and here's Munchman, which didn't seem to have the same issues as Jawbreaker, but is pretty much a, a real take on Pac-Man. Ah, uh, up next is Hunt the Wumpus, which was released in the fourth quarter of 1980. Now, interestingly enough, this is based on a game that was originally a text-based game in the 70s. 
Now, Hunt the Wumpus is kind of like a, uh, a puzzle. I'd, I'd almost equate it to like a Minesweeper type game. You basically move your player around. You've got indicators. Uh, you got to watch out for tar pits and, and the Wumpus who tries to eat you. Your goal is to, to kill the Wumpus with your arrow. And as you go through, you get indicators. Green lines tell you you're close to a pit and the red dots tell you you're close to a Wumpus. And then you sort of map that out and you take your best guess, take your best shot. Now the little bat looking thing is a crazy magical bat where occasionally when you step on one, it'll just randomly throw you across the board. And of course, like so many games from this time period, it's so sound intensive. Every move you make, you get this nice beep. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. All right, and yet another classic here, Amazing, which is quite honestly an amazing game. This is probably one of the favorites, released in the first quarter of 1981. There's a lot of different ways to play this, but the premise is the same. You gotta navigate through a maze, sometimes picking up cheese, sometimes just going your way through. As you can see, the simple maze, you can finish those off pretty easily. Something that even a kid could play. Or you can crank it up and have a complex maze with a couple cats that run around and actively try to get you. Of course, the most fun is just cranking those cats up to crazy and making them jump all over the place. This is pure luck to get through a maze like this.
All right, and our final game today is a classic called Parsec, which was released in 1982. And honestly, this is probably one of the best games for the ti 984 a And I know that's debatable, but hey, that's how I feel. And it's a scrolling kind of space shooter kind of game with a whole bunch of different craft that come down. They basically try to ram into you or they try to shoot you. And you gotta watch out that you don't shoot your laser too much and blow up, run out of fuel and crash or crash in the various things. Now, this is definitely a game where I'm having a lot of issues with the joysticks. I'm gonna have to take them apart and, and clean them or fix them. First off, the fire button is very random, whether or not it works when you press it. And the other thing is, and the keyboard's the same way, the ship moves way too far. So basically, this is a real problem when it comes time to refuel. This game was actually developed by Jim Dramas and Paul Urbanus, and interestingly enough, if you watch the scrolling field on the on the bottom, there's a point where you can actually see their uh, their initials, respectively, J E D and U R B. And actually, notice in the names of some of the ships, the Dramites and the Urbites, they're actually named after them. Um, there was actually a third type of ship, which was the Binite, which. It's thought that that's apparently named after Don Bynum, who was the manager of TI's personal computer division. Which is kind of interesting, especially as we talked earlier about the synergies that came together to build the TI-994A. At the end of every level, you have to shoot your way through an asteroid field. This would actually be a really cool spot for me to have the speech synthesizer if I had one, because it actually talks to you and gives you some indications of how long the field is going to last. Now, of course, we had some joystick issues again here. Let's blame it on the joystick, right? As you exit the asteroid belt, it changes the field color to go to the next level. It takes you back to the first round of ships, but they're all a little bit harder. As we've seen today, much like the DeLorean, the TMS9900 CPU, and the TI-994A home computer, well, they aimed to be revolutionary, but basically resulted in failure. And just the same as their vehicular counterpart, the TI-994A became a cult classic, and quite honestly, an endearing piece of kit with a strong following to this day. And as shown, many of the games remain enjoyable to play, even to this day, even with their comparative simplicity compared to modern games. And the TI-994A was sold so cheaply that many families who weren't in the market for a home computer ended up purchasing one, mainly due to that low price. Now, of course, we learned this wasn't good for TI in the long run, but it did offer many folks their forced foray into the computing world. Now, for some, that gave them a head start on technology. For others, it opened them up to a hobby and offered fond memories of a vintage computing era. Now, as a result, it's actually easy to find several emulators for modern computers so that you too can play TI-994A games or even write TI Basic on your modern hardware. And still, there's a small group of devotees that still develop hardware and unique parts, adapters, and add-on cards that keep the enjoyment of the TI-994A alive to this day. And what about Texas Instruments? I mean, whatever happened to them? Well, while TI did exit the home computer market in 1984, their experience with speech synthesis, digital signal processing, and chip manufacturing allowed them to refocus their business model. And TI became a primary leader in the DSP world and would continue being a major supplier of peripheral chips. 
And Texas Instruments still operates strongly to this day as a leader in embedded chips, ICs, and software services. And of course, we have the legacy of the TMS9900 CPU. That's right, the TI994A home computer, which is a really cool piece of vintage computer gear that we get to enjoy. And we hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, there's more to come here on Vortex Garage.